Multilateral cooperation and financial collaboration, the panacea to the ongoing economic crisis. Well, that's what most academics and leaders in politics and business agree on as the World Government Summit wraps up in Dubai today. Well, we talked to Gilles Carbonier of the International Committee of the Red Cross about key challenges in dealing with unpredictable humanitarian emergencies. Well, thanks for joining us uh, on Channel News Asia, Mr. Carbonier. Uh, first up, let's just start with a big picture question. What are just some of the key challenges facing the humanitarian and development sector in terms of financing as well as resource mobilization? Well, if you are taking the, the worldwide situation, I think the big challenge is we see needs for assistance uh, increasing. We have a uh, crisis on crisis on crisis. And I think Syria illustrates this well. You have had 12 years of armed conflict, <clears throat> then the COVID-19 pandemic, then a cholera outbreak, and now an earthquake. And all of this adds to the vulnerability of people in Syria, but also in so many other places in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. And of course, with the needs increasing, there is an increasing gap between the needs and the resources available. So we must find ways and means to address the plight and the needs of the most vulnerable by joining forces, as you mentioned, between humanitarian development actors and others, including the private sector. Balance the economic analysis with, you know, the realities of all these fast moving humanitarian emergencies like the big quakes, as, as you've mentioned, that hit Turkey and Syria. And we know that aid to Syria, for instance, has been slowed by sanctions and conflict. How can we do better in this regard? Well, in Syria, we have uh, about 900 staff working together, uh, the ICRC together with the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. We were on the ground in Aleppo, in the north of Syria, when the earthquake hit. So immediately we have provided medical assistance to the hospital in Aleppo, but also mattresses, blankets, so the people would not freeze at night. We have provided over 100,000 bottles of drinking, safe drinking water, because you had a cholera outbreak. But we have to think to the next step, which is people will need, and survivors, they will need shelter, they will need access to essential services, especially medical services, the safe drinking water, wastewater treatment. And for this, we will need to invest in maintaining and upgrading essential services. At uh, the same time as the Carbonet in Ukraine, the war is still ongoing. We saw the worst refugee crisis in Europe since World War II, and it looks like we don't know when the war is going to end. Are you worried that as the economy changes, you know, we've got inflation, we've got recessionary fears, that philanthropy will get hit and people and, and, and corporates becoming less generous? Well, as I mentioned, there is a risk indeed that we see a growing gap between the needs what we need to provide vulnerable people with and the resources available. And last year, this year, uh, we had uh, quite some media attention and rightly so on Ukraine, now on Syria, Turkey. But we have also Afghanistan, we have Syria, we have uh, Yemen, we have the Sahel, Lake Chad region, the Horn of Africa. So we really need to step up collectively. Now on your question on Ukraine, uh, I think figures speak for themselves. Uh, 8 million people uh, who had to move out of the country, or 6 million, 8 million displaced, uh, a majority of the population possibly uh, uh, needing some type of relief assistance. So the situation is extremely dire. And uh, what we do as International Committee of the Red Cross is first and foremost to engage with the parties, to engage with everyone involved, so that the Geneva Conventions this fundamental principle of humanity are respected by all, which means protecting the civilians, protecting civilian infrastructure, and also abiding by these rules of humanity regarding prisoners of war, etc. So we have worked with both, of course, the Ukrainian authorities, but also the Russian authorities. We are in dialogue with, uh, with the authorities to progress on this very important front to prevent further suffering. At the same time, with the Ukrainian Red Cross, we are stepping up the relief effort. One domain where we have invested heavily is with the water board, with the water authorities, to make sure that in municipalities, 
<coughs> water keeps being provided. Uh, heating uh, is also up and running, especially during this harsh winter. So these are all types of very important responses that we must keep uh, maintaining for the Ukrainian people. Mm. And in terms of key trends and developments in the field of uh, humanitarian economics that you see as particularly important for improving the responses to crises, and I'm wondering what's also your thoughts on ASEAN's role in this? Well, it's a very interesting question because I think in ASEAN, uh, because you are also in a region that is very prone to disasters, you have developed in ASEAN very novel, uh, innovative financial uh, mechanisms to try to have uh, insurance systems, uh, uh, so-called cat bonds and other risk linked securities that can help uh, actually provide uh, preventive mechanisms and also some incentives so that when a disaster struck, strikes, you have less victims and uh, those victims are being compensated, they are being supported. And I think this wealth of experiences you have garnered in the ASEAN area is very useful now to the whole world, both in terms of uh, uh, what can be done in terms of prevention, uh, uh, disaster prevention and disaster response, but also nowadays in other type of uh, man-made protracted conflicts, crisis, and uh, I think this is one very important aspect. The other important aspect is that with uh, emerging economies of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you have an important voice, an important role to play. And we are very pleased to see our own relationship and dialogue with uh, the countries of ASEAN uh, maturing and engaging on humanitarian diplomacy, engaging on international humanitarian law, and also engaging on humanitarian funding. Um, let's just talk about, you know, the recent cryptocurrency collapse. Where do you see blockchain-enabled fundraising? Do you think it still remains a promising option to transform the charity landscape? Well, I think uh, if you look at crypto uh, technologies, one advantage which could be really useful is uh, the traceability, is to really make sure that transactions go from, uh, you know, the, the emitter to the uh, to the intended recipient. So we are very keen to explore what kind of uh, innovation could be uh, promoted to make sure, that, for instance, when we shift to cash-based assistance, that the money that is uh, geared to, uh, to, to the most vulnerable reaches them uh, with all the safety, the security, and the accountability required. So this is one area where I see uh, quite some promise. And there are other aspects of new you know, advances in technology and science that offers huge potential to improve or enhance the effectiveness of our humanitarian response. And just finally, what do you hope the government leaders attending this summit, what is the one key takeaway uh, they would have to better respond to you know, our future humanitarian crises? Well, here in Dubai, I met this World um, Government Summit, and I can see a lot of solidarity expressed by all leaders for the plight of uh, the victims of the earthquake in Syria and, and Turkey. And this is really welcome. But I think this mobilization must translate into effective support. And I see this support, for instance, with the uh, Emirati Red Crescent and uh, the UAE uh, providing already direct support, also Asian countries expressing and sending direct support to the region. But I think what is also clear from my conversation here is that we have still a large untapped potential of better partnering between humanitarian and development actors with the private sector and governments to find out uh, uh, you know, more synergetic ways of scaling up solutions. And I can give you examples, but uh, I don't know if the time is uh, allows it. But I think these type of solutions would offer more durable solution to reinforce the resilience of communities, of systems that are under huge stress. All right, we'll leave things as that for now. Thanks very much for your time and thoughts. Gilles Garbonnier there. Thank you.